Welcome to our second COVID-19 Empower Hour, Learn How to Stop the Spread. Today is March 21st, 2020. I am Sharon Pitter alongside Shneri Enzi, and we will be hosting today's Fireside Chat with our guest, Dr. Chidi Akisovi. Welcome, Dr. Chidi. But before we bring on our guest, Shneri will tell us about the services that African Services Committee provides to our community. Hi, I'm Chinyere um, Enze, and I'd like to talk about uh, services at African Services Committee. African Services Committee is a multi-service human rights agency in Harlem, dedicated to assisting immigrants, refugees, and asylees from across the African diaspora. We provide free and confidential health, housing, legal, social welfare, education, nutrition, and advocacy services, regardless of your immigration status or ability to pay. African Services Committee provides free COVID-19 testing PCR at its walk-in testing centers on Mondays to Fridays at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You can call or text us at 212-222-3882. Two one two 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 three eight eight two. For questions or concerns about COVID nineteen vaccination, please contact the HRSA team at eight six two two four eight two eight six four, or email us at covidvasoutreach at africanservices.org. We also provide services in Spanish and in French. Thank you. Our agenda today will, was our introduction, followed by our fireside chat, and then we'll have a Q&A session open to our audience or attendees. You can submit your questions or comments in the Q&A box. Our, our guest, as I mentioned, is Dr. Chidi Akasobi. Dr. Chidi was born in Nigeria and grew up in, in the Bronx. He graduated magna cum laude from Yale University and afterwards was awarded a Gates Cambridge scholarship to pursue a master's of philosophy in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge. Currently, Chetty is in his eighth and final year of the MD PhD program at Harvard Medical School. Chetty successfully defended his PhD in microbiology and infectious diseases in June of 2022 and will be starting his internal medicine residence at Massachusetts General Hospital this summer. Outside of working in the hospital and lab, Chidi has been involved in several initiatives to increase the pipeline of underrepresented minority students in science and medicine. As a future physician scientist, Chidi hopes to combine clinical practice, teaching and research that contributes to improved treatment of infectious diseases. Welcome again, Dr. Chitty. And my first question for you today is what inspired you to become a physician scientist? Okay, thank you for the introduction, everyone. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this discussion. Um, yeah, so the question of what inspired me to be a physician scientist, I would say growing up, I was inspired uh, to basically pursue medicine because both my parents were actually studying to be nurses uh, when we came to America. So to backtrack, um, I was born in Nigeria, came to the Bronx at the age of two. Both my parents were also recent immigrants to the United States as well. And nursing for them was their way to basically, you know, find good jobs in America and access the American dream. And so studying, uh, while they were studying to be nurses, I was a little boy and I would be surrounded by the nursing textbooks, medical textbooks, and was just really inspired by a lot of the images that I saw. Um, and so that was sort of the introduction uh, to medicine. Um, growing up, I was also really interested in the sciences. The sciences came naturally to me. Um, and medicine, in my mind, <clears throat> was a great way to actually apply science to the betterment of advancing human health and human disease and actually making an impact in people's lives. And so my natural interest and aptitude in science, coupled with you know parents that inspired me uh, to enter medicine, coupled with the fact that medicine is a really good way and a really inspiring and fulfilling way to give back to the communities is what inspired me to be a physician. Um, and then 
you know, coming from Nigeria, from West African background, a lot of the problems that, you know, people in my community, my, my family members and friends of uh, my family uh, suffer from were, you know, infectious diseases and were um, a lot of medical problems. And so for me, what continued this uh, spark uh, for wanting to be a physician scientist was seeing this as a way to also, you know, not only give back to communities here in the United States, but also to communities uh, back home in Nigeria as well. Um, and, you know, the MD PhD, which allows me to be a physician scientist, is a career path where I can use and do research and actually advance knowledge for it that can then be applied to medicine and to, you know, push treatment forward or push new diagnostics. And so ultimately, I would say it's a desire to give back by using science and medicine. Um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And Dr. Chidi. What does it mean for you to increase the representation of minority students in science and medicine? Yeah, you know, this is a really big problem that in recent years, especially, people have uh, started to discuss and be much more open about. Currently in the United States, about 5% of physicians are Black, about the same for, you know, Hispanic or Latino physicians. Two and a half percent of physicians are Black men. So the numbers are very low um, and, and quite disproportionate to our numbers uh, in the general population. And this matters because we know that there's so many disparities that exist in healthcare when it comes to the types of um, treatments and the types of quality of healthcare that you know people of color in the United States experience. And if I, if we can increase the numbers of you know black and brown students entering science and medicine, we not only will you know inspire future generations to do the same, but we will actually also uh, administer better care and actually help solve some of the the deep seated. Uh, problems when it comes to disparities in healthcare by improving our numbers. And so for me, what it means is doing the work to inspire students who are, you know, below me, um, whether they are in medical school or undergraduate or even in elementary school, it's never too early to start, and actually being a role model for those sorts of students who have the interest. Also, I think just showing up, I've spent a lot of time over the years going into public schools, going into different elementary school and high school after school programs and actually uh, showing students what my path was to go from, you know, someone who was in their shoes to eventually doing an MD PhD at Harvard. I think for so long, including for me back when I was younger, I didn't have a conception of these careers because no one I knew was really, you know, studying to be a physician or studying to be a scientist. And yes. so just showing up and being someone that exists that they can see uh, <laughs> there's a path forward to becoming, I think, uh, it, it makes me really happy. And I, I also know over the years has uh, inspired several students to embark on the path. Um, yeah, I think this is a really important uh, issue and, and uh, I'm hoping to do my small part in helping to increase our representation. Absolutely. I know it's very important for us to see people um, that look like us, talk like us in these areas. So we know that we can do that as well. I know you came up through Prep for Prep. Um, how yeah. does the program like that help you? You know, they have Oliver program, you have Wazi scholars and Prep, yeah. and a lot of them. How did that help you on your way? Oh my God, I always say that Prep for Prep changed my life. If not for Prep for Prep, I would not be sitting here in front of you all talking about, you know, my path forward. And the reason why is because I attended, you know, a Bronx public school. Um, and, you know, my parents were doing their best to school, you know, I'm one of, I'm the oldest of four, so there's four of us in total, they're new immigrants to a country, they tried their best to support not only ourselves, but uh, their, our entire family back home in Nigeria. So while they were doing their best, we were going to public schools in the Bronx that were just not great, honestly, there just weren't a lot of resources in these public schools. And so even if students had a lot of um, interest or a lot of aptitude or a lot of ambition, the school we didn't supply that with money resources to help students, you know, really push forward. And so this is where Prep for Prep came along. They basically are a program that takes gifted students in the fifth grade and gives them additional academic rigorous training that then allows them to transition to private schools in the city. And so if not for Prep for Prep, I would have still been in a public school that, you know, I was taking science classes once a week. You know, in sixth grade, we were learning how to add two digit numbers. You know, the education system in New York, and not just New York, and you know, a lot of places in the country just isn't, uh, isn't great because of resources. Um, and PrEP gave me the resources. And the second thing PrEP did 
is that it has amazing mentors, students of color who are in college, a little bit after college, who were studying to be doctors or lawyers, people who wanted to be engineers, people who just had really big dreams. And it, it kind of shifted in my mind at a young age what it is that I felt I could do just because I was surrounded by prep for prep alumni who were doing it. And so it no longer became something that I didn't believe I can do. I knew people who were my advisors who were studying to be medical directors or were doctors themselves. Um, and so prep for prep did two things. It's, the op- it's giving me the actual resources and training me and then surrounding me with people who inspired me to you know, be, want to be more for myself. Absolutely, thank you for that. Now, Dr. Che, we're going to go into our COVID questions. Yes. And, you know, I know my audience is waiting for answers about, you know, how do we look at COVID? And one of the first questions that I have for you is what is COVID-19 and what do we need to know about it? Yeah, oh my God. So I saw this question. I was like, this is a broad question, but a good question. It's, <laughs> it's like an introduction to the entire talk. Um, so it's helpful to actually break down what some of these words mean. So COVID-19 actually stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. And the reason why it's 2019 was because that's the first time that, um, you know, COVID-19 was identified and discovered um, back in December of that year, 2019. Um, COVID-19 is a disease and it's caused by a virus and the virus is called SARS-CoV-2. Now, the name of the virus for most people doesn't matter, but what's important to know is that the virus causes the disease known as COVID-19 and that the virus is transmitted via the air. It's a respiratory virus, meaning that you can get infected by just breathing in air that has the virus floating in it. And it causes lots of different symptoms, but the main ones to sort of think about is that it's a respiratory infection, which means it causes problems in your upper and lower respiratory tract. So sneezing, coughing, um, that's sort of the main sy- symptoms that, um, that are the mild ones. And then um, you can get a severe infection where you actually have shortness of breath and you have fatigue and trouble breathing, pneumonia. And unfortunately, some people end up going to the ICU intubated. So there's a machine that helps them breathe. And unfortunately, some people pass. Um, the world has known about COVID-19 for the past two years and counting. And there's so much to say about this virus because um, it is totally novel. It is new. Um, but the main thing that I would end with is that we have strategies in place to actually prevent us from getting COVID-19, or if we get COVID-19, to not have a very severe infection. And so we know that masks work. It's a respiratory virus. And so if you are covering your face and your nose, and your mouth and your nose with masks, you're preventing the virus from being under, able to enter your body. We know masks work. We now have vaccines for over a year. Vaccines give us immunity against um, developing, you know, really severe COVID-19. Um, and then we also now have treatments for people who are, are sick and can have actually take pills to make them not develop severe, severe disease. So in summary, COVID-19 is a disease caused by a new virus that was discovered back in 2019. Um, it causes mainly respiratory symptoms, lung problems, but it has lots of other symptoms as well, which we can talk about. And lastly, we can protect ourselves with masks, with vaccines, washing our hands, um, and you know, and protecting others too by having your family members and friends also vaccinated and wearing masks, et cetera. Thanks for that answer as well. And how did the virus spread and change so fast in our communities, Dr. Che? Yeah, so this answer is a great question and the answer has many parts. And so how did the virus spread and change so fast? Um, so one reason why it spread so fast is that you can think about it before 2019, this virus was not known to humanity. So it was the entire population of the world was immune. In fact, uh, it was not immune to this virus. We were totally naive to it, which means that every single person on earth was, uh, was, had the potential to be infected. Um, there's no baseline immunity. So that's one. Two, it's a respiratory virus, which means that, as I mentioned earlier, it spreads via the air. That's a very efficient way to spread disease by just breathing it in and out. And so unlike other diseases that have to be spread, you know, via mosquitoes, for instance, or via, you know, contaminated water, we are always breathing in air every day, every second of our lives. If the virus is spread through our air, it's very easy to transmit. And then the third and really big part is that people can actually spread the disease asymptomatically which means that people were able to spread the disease and not feel sick at all. And so you could be infected and you could be shedding virus, so breathing out virus, 
and yet feel totally fine. And actually a good percentage of COVID infections are asymptomatic. And so people are spreading the disease, but have no clue that they're sick. And that is what allows COVID-19 in particular to be spread so quickly or a virus to be spread so quickly because so many people were spreading it and had no clue because they were totally fine. Um, and then the second part of the question is why does the virus uh, change so quickly? I would say that all viruses and actually everything on earth mutates, but let's focus on viruses. All viruses change. Um, and that's because as viruses infect new people, um, they uh, develop mutations in their genomes. Um, most of these mutations don't do anything. But every now and then you get some mutations that give the virus some properties that makes it a little better at being transmitted. So it makes the virus maybe create more copies of itself, or you can have a mutation that allows it to escape the immune system. Um, and so when these new mutations come up and enough of them come up in a virus that gives them this virus a new, um, new traits, we call these vi uh, new uh, viruses, variants of concern, so variants that uh, have um, an ability to infect faster or to evade vaccines or to, you know, cause different symptoms. Um, and so it, it, the viruses change because that's what viruses do. But what we care about are, are any of these changes significant? Um, and it turns out that over the past two years, we've had some variants come out like the Delta and the Omicron variants that had significant differences in how quickly they can spread. Um, and that is what we are looking out for. And that's what we care about. Okay. All right. Thank you. And as you said, variants, our next question will be about the variants. What is a variant and what is the difference between the Delta and the Omicron variant? Yeah. So the way I describe it is that the original virus, we can call it the OG virus or the OG strain was the one from 2019. And as this virus infected more and more people, mutations would arise. And every now and then, a collection of mutations would arise that gave this original strain a new set of properties that we cared about. Um, and so one of these uh, variants, the Delta variant, emerged you know, last year, summer, first detected in India. And an Omicron variant arose um, you know, December, November of 2021 that was first detected in South Africa. So these are basically variants. These are variations of the original strain that have properties that make it a little bit more concerning uh, for, for physicians and also for people. So on a molecular level, looking at the actual mutations themselves, the Delta and Omicron variants have mutations in the spike protein. And the spike protein is what allows us, what allows the virus to infect our cells. Uh, they both have variations in their spike protein that make the viruses more infectious. So Delta and Omicron are more infectious than the original strain. Omicron is different from Delta in that it had even more mutations in the spike protein. And so Omicron was even more uh, transmissible, more infectious than Delta. And I think for most people, that's the biggest difference that we cared about. The other really big difference we cared about is that Omicron had so many additional mutations that it actually was a little bit, um, it was able to evade some of the immune responses of, uh, that we generate after being vaccinated. And so vaccines still protected people from Omicron and that people didn't get severely sick and end up in the hospital. But that meant that because Omicron was so different from the original strain, people still got infected, just not being sick. Um, so I would say those are the main differences between the two variants. The big one is that Omicron was just less severe um, mm -hmm. in the symptoms that it caused. So Delta, and, uh, Delta led a lot of people to end up in a hospital. It was a pretty... Mm -hmm transmissible, but also cause some severe disease, whereas Omicron was really transmissible, but not as severe. Um, and so most people had milder infections. And if you were vaccinated and boosted, then Omicron really felt like a nasty cold. For people who are not vaccinated or for people who had comorbid conditions, Omicron is still obviously, um, you know, uh, a variant that you have to worry about. Um, but that, yeah, in summary, the, the differences were Delta and Omicron are more transmissible than the original strain, and Delta was more severe in terms of the symptoms it caused, and Omicron was louder. It's not as severe. So one was more severe, the Delta, and the Omicron was not as severe, but it spread faster than the Delta variant. Exactly. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Chady. And I'm going to, my next question is, has your research on microbacterium abscesses, which is related to 
the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, helped you to understand COVID-19 in any way? Yeah, so I did my research in infectious disease lab studying, as mentioned here in the question, mycobacterium abscessus. So this is a bacteria that causes really nasty infections all across your body. And if you get infected with this bacteria, you have to take antibiotics for sometimes upwards of two years. It's really resistant to a lot of treatment, um, more resistant than actually tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And so this research was all I was studying, basically the basic biology of a bacteria that causes disease. Um, and in doing that, I learned some really basic skills that can be applied to any, any virus or bacteria that causes disease. So one, I learned how to read papers and learn how to read the scientific literature and understand the data and use that data to draw conclusions about, you know, what this study was trying to answer. Um, that's really a technical and hard skill because papers are not written in the way that are, that the general public can understand because there's a lot of technical expertise that goes into you know doing research projects and so mm -hmm. by doing research project by doing research in this organism i was able to understand the research that was done in covid um, so that's one i think two also understanding uh how research is done so i understand the questions that people ask and how they ask them and what are the limitations of um of those studies and that allows you to then look at covid research and say okay I understand what the question they were asking. I, I see the answer, and I also know what the limits of the answers are. All of this is to say that doing a PhD in infectious disease allows you to understand uh, effectively how P how research is done in infectious diseases. And so I was able to utilize that training to understand what COVID nineteen was, understand what the research was being done to help combat it, um, and then. The most important thing is translating that. So understanding the research and translating it in a way that the general public can understand. Um, and that is a skill that the PhD also taught me to you need to be able to not only do your science, but explain your science to other people. Um, and I, I have been very fortunate to be able to do that sort of translation work around COVID-19 in the same way that I've done it with my research. Okay, awesome, that's, that's great. I'm glad you were able to transfer some of that information into COVID-19. And like you said, you learned how to do the research and that skill set that you have helped you to also analyze the COVID-19 virus and also to relay that to the general population. Thank you so much, Dr. Teddy. Thank you. COVID-19 has greatly affected communities of color. Given our legacy around the Tuskegee experiments, Etc. Some communities did not readily accept the science around COVID-19. What can we tell someone we know about COVID-19 if they mistrust the information? Yeah, this is such an important question, especially when the vaccines first came out, because I understand that for a lot of people, you know, one day they're living their lives and then COVID-19 was, you know, announced as a problem. And then a couple of months to almost a year later, we had vaccines and people rightfully so were wondering, okay, but where did these vaccines come from? Who was developing, developing them? And can we trust the people who were doing this given the, you know, many, many examples of uh, injustices and mistreatment in the past. And so this question is coming from a very good and important place. Um, and the first thing I would say is you need to find trusted, folks, trusted advisors, trusted communicators to who are going to approach this conversation with a really uh, open mind and who are willing to answer any question that someone would have. No, and no question is too dumb or too silly or too basic. Like we're all here to actually learn from each other. So that's the first thing I would, I would tell someone. It's, I would say, hey, I understand where you're coming from. Let's sit down and actually have this conversation in good faith where you can ask me everything and anything you want, any myths that you have heard, any, you know, uh, you know, conspiracy theories, whatever it is, like, let's talk about it. Um, and you need to talk about it with someone who you trust, who you know that they are coming from a place, of, from a same place of understanding as you. Um, I think the second thing I would say is you want to also talk to people who are knowledgeable. Um, and so I, for instance, when the vaccines were first, uh, you know, announced, I read the entire 55 page report that Pfizer announced, uh, that Pfizer submitted to the FDA. Um, and so that was actually looking at the hard data themselves. So I understood the percentages of people who are in the trials, how many were black, how many were Hispanic, how many were Asian. I understood because I read 
uh, exactly how the vaccines were packaged, right? You need to actually talk to people who understand the very nitty gritty details. So when people are asking you, I heard when people are saying, you know, I hear that there's 5G in the vaccines, or I hear that it causes infertility. I can actually answer those questions with real factual based information that I myself have looked at and have reviewed and have uh, come to understand myself. Um, and then the third thing I would, I would tell people is that, you know, no one is, I never told folks that I'm here to force you to get the vaccine. Like that's not actually the point of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Our point, I love the word empower because that's actually the point of having these conversations. I want to empower you with information for you to then make the decision on your own. But what I would hate for people to do is to make decisions based off lies and based off conspiracy theories that other people have effectively created to make the decision for you. And I think I like to frame this conversation as empowerment and as giving you tools and information and making the decision yourself instead of being fear mongered into, the, into another decision. Because ultimately, who does it benefit for people to not get vaccinated or for people to get COVID-19? It's not you, right? Um, and so Absolutely. if you're making a decision on your own, then that makes me happy. But I want the decision to be based off uh, knowledge that, you know, I'm privileged to have and other people are privileged to have and you should be privileged to have too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's true. So learn how to empower yourself by doing your research, trusting the information that's there. But at, in the long run, it's it's all going to benefit you. So you have to put in the work by empowering right. yourself about this information. Thank you so much, Dr. Chetty. That was an awesome answer for that question. I'm going to go now to my next question for Dr. Chetty. It's what is long COVID? And is there anything we can do for people experiencing symptoms from it? Yeah, so long COVID is this phenomenon that we have uh, since identified where um, people, I should backtrack and say when people, when most people get sick, they get COVID um, and the sickness, they, you know, they, they don't feel great for a couple of days. And after a while, um, the symptoms resolve and they come back to their baseline level of health. That is how most COVID infections go. You get sick, you feel better, and you feel just like you were before you got COVID. Unfortunately, for a certain subpopulation of people, they get COVID, they recover, but they have lingering symptoms that last for weeks to months. And so they actually never return back to their baseline, but instead they have all these different ailments and all these different symptoms that cause them to, you know, continue to feel sick, but not as, as sick as when they had COVID. And we call these lingering symptoms long COVID. Um, and effectively, people who uh, had severe COVID illnesses tend to be the ones who develop long COVID, but you can actually develop long COVID if you had mild infections or asymptomatic. It's really hard to predict. Mm -hmm. And what these symptoms are, for the most part, you know, people still feel short of breath after having COVID, they feel really fatigued, no exercise tolerance, which is our way of, which is the medical profession's way of saying, if they get, if they become active or try to work out, you know, they get really tired really easily. Some people have brain fog, meaning that they have difficulty thinking and concentrating. Um, there's cough, chest pain, stomach pain. Some people feel headaches, joint pains, fevers, trouble sleeping. There's a lot of these like constellations of symptoms that people feel after getting COVID, known as long COVID. Um, the best thing that we can do to prevent long COVID is to not get COVID or get severe COVID, Absolutely. which is to say that you want to follow preventative strategies. Getting vaccinated is the biggest, biggest thing. We know that getting vaccinated prevents you from getting COVID-19, severe sickness, and, and reduces your chance of getting uh, uh, long COVID. Um, and right now, I would say that there are large, large studies being done to understand exactly how long COVID is um, how it basically manifests, what the symptoms are, who are the people who are getting them, and then if there's any treatments and preventative strategies out there. The crazy thing to think about is that this is a totally new phenomenon as of you know, a year and some change. And so it's going to take the medical profession some time to figure out exactly what it is that we're dealing with and also how best to you know, treat people. Um, it's, it's, it's sad. You can go online and like read a lot of stories of people whose health has completely changed after getting COVID and you don't know what bucket you'll fit in. And so that's one of the reasons why I tell people getting vaccinated is really important because even if you're not afraid of COVID, you don't know if you will be the person who will suffer from long-term side effects from COVID that last months, maybe even years. 
Absolutely. And as Dr. Chetty said, the best way to prevent long COVID is to get vaccinated. Not getting COVID in the first place will help you to not experience symptoms of long COVID. So get vaccinated, everyone, if you haven't yet already done so. Thank Absolutely. you. And um, Dr. Chetty, how does the vaccine work? And why should we get vaccinated? Yeah. Um, so how does the vaccine work? There are many vaccines that are actually out right now in the world. The ones that are the most commonly used in America are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And those ones have the same mechanism. They work effectively the same way. And so basically these vaccines have instructions that tell our body to make the spike protein. The spike protein of the virus is what allows the virus to bind our cells and enter them and cause disease. And so these vaccines have this molecule called mRNA, which acts like a blueprint instructions to tell our cells in our body to make the spike protein. The immune, we have immune cells in our body that recognize this spike protein as foreign, as a protein that's not from human, from us, but, our, but in fact is from the virus. And we develop antibodies against this foreign protein, against the spike protein. And what the antibodies do is that they bind the spike protein and prevent the virus from entering our cells if we were to encounter the virus in the future. And so you get vaccinated to create antibodies against the virus that causes COVID-19 so that if you were to encounter it, you already have protection antibodies against the virus. So that's how the vaccines work, the, at least the Pfizer and Moderna ones. Um, and these vaccines are uh, wonderful in that they are so well tolerated um, and that uh, after you know two doses, after getting it two doses, it's about 95% effective. And of course, that you know, the level of antibodies decrease over time. And so that's why we get booster shots. So that as the antibody level decreases over time, you get a booster that brings that antibody back levels back up. Um, and so that's what the point of the boosters are. That's how boosters work. Um, the reasons for getting vaccinated are numerous. The most obvious is that they prevent uh, severe COVID-19 infection. So the whole name of the game of getting vaccinated is that you have some immunity so that if you were to get COVID, you are not going to end up in a hospital, you know, fighting for oxygen, intubated, and ultimately, uh, you know, risking your life. Um, so that's the biggest reason to get vaccinated. It prevents you from being sick. It also prevents your community, people you live with, people you hang out with, from also potentially getting sick because it reduces transmission as well. And so even though for most people, COVID-19 tends to be a mild illness, you don't know who you're interacting with that could actually, you know, have some sort of condition that makes COVID really deadly and really scary. And so it, it's also incumbent on us to get vaccinated to protect our, our communities and the, our loved ones from also getting COVID, um, especially, you know, the elder, the elder population as well. We talked about long COVID. That's another reason to get vaccinated. You know, even if you get COVID, um, e even if you don't want to get COVID, um, long COVID is also another experience that most people don't want to get. And so uh, it prevents against that as well. Um, and then this is another reason I have to say, even if you don't care about any of the health effects, it's becoming increasingly uh, the case that uh, certain workforces, like certain jobs, certain uh, places to uh, you know eat, drink, sleep, where there are lots of uh, new regulations that are coming up that require proof of vaccination. Um, and I, I don't think that's going to be changing anytime soon. And so if you want to have access to some of these, um, you know, uh, activities of daily life, vac getting vaccinated just makes that process much easier and also protects you because once you're in public, you're at risk of, you know, being exposed to the virus. And what better way? And we all want to get back to our some sort of sense of normal and vaccines allow us to do that without having the fear of potentially getting sick. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And like you said, we, we're, we're always, um, we're such a close knit community. Um, being in the city here, you know, a lot of people are out and about, we're in the trains, we're in dining together. And so by getting vaccinated, we can protect each other. It's not just about myself, it's about me, you, and the other person that, that you know, we're associated with. So that's another important reason for us to just make sure we get vaccinated. And thank you, Dr. Chetty, for that um, great answer. And I'll just take this moment to get our audience if there are anyone out there you can submit your questions and comments in the q a box for dr chetty and then we'll get to that at the appropriate time 
But for now, my next question will be, does natural immunity from COVID-19 exist? If so, how long does it last? And is it better than getting a vaccine? Yes, this is a fantastic question because there's a lot of misinformation out there regarding natural immunity to COVID. Um, so the simple answer is yes, of course, natural immunity does exist with COVID. Whenever our immune system encounters a foreign pathogen, a foreign virus or bacteria, our bodies would do its best to fight against that bacteria or virus and develop natural immunity against it. The thing is that immunity does not last forever. And we know that because we often we commonly get sick with the common cold. We often get stomach viruses, you know, stomach flus. Um, there's lots of uh, infections that we routinely get because even though we have immunity to them, the immunity doesn't last forever. But the biggest reason why getting vaccinated is better than getting COVID naturally and having immunity from that is that getting vaccinated is a safer and more reliable way to protect yourself against COVID. Because if you get COVID-19, a natural infection, you are now opening up yourself to all the different negative things that can happen from an infection, including dying, but also ending up in a hospital really sick, getting long COVID, having uh, uh, long-term organ damage. These are all things that will ha can happen if you get COVID-19 and then end up having natural immunity, but with all these other long-term side effects of having COVID. Whereas vaccines actually give you immunity to COVID without getting the disease. That is the whole point of vaccination. That is why they've been a medical miracle for the past 100 years. And not only that, getting vaccinated from COVID-19 actually gives you higher antibody levels. You get more protection against COVID and that protection lasts longer. And there's been a lot of studies that have come out that actually compares people who have natural COVID immunity versus people who have immunity from vaccines. And we've seen that if you have, if you've been vaccinated from COVID, you're two times less likely to end up getting COVID again. And so that tells you that getting natural, getting natural immunity from COVID um, still leaves you at risk, two times higher risk of getting COVID again, as opposed to the vaccine. Um, and there's another study shown, done by CDC that showed that people who got uh, vaccinated from COVID, or who, sorry, I should say people who were not vaccinated from COVID, so people who had natural immunity, were five times more likely to test positive for COVID again than for people who were vaccinated. And so we have real life data that shows us that vaccine immunity is stronger and lasts longer than natural immunity and doesn't come with the potential risks of getting sick, having long COVID, and potentially even you know suffering from the worst consequences of the disease. Absolutely. That was a great answer. Thanks for that. That was very detailed and yes. <laughs> and I th I think our audience will um will appreciate that because you know um a lot of times in our work, Chineri and I will hear people say, you know, we have natural immunity, but here you're saying that even with that natural immunity, you're still more susceptible to even getting COVID again. So the vaccine is definitely important in curtailing that. So right. thank you. And what lessons, Dr. Chetty, have we learned from COVID-19 that will prepare us for the next pandemic or the next uh, epidemic that's on, on, on the horizon? Yeah, so many, so many lessons. I wanna try and limit it to three, um, but as we know, there's just the world has changed completely from, <laughs> from COVID. And so there's just a lot of reflections and lessons learned, but I would say one of the main, the three main ones I would say is the first, the importance of research and research enterprise to help drive new vaccines and new treatments. We would not be returning to a sense of normal if not for the um, amazing and hard work that scientists have done over the past, honestly, for decades, because mRNA research has been going on for decades, but really in the past couple of years, in the past year, there's been so much work to get us new COVID vaccines and get us new COVID treatments so that we are no longer have to live in fear from this virus and can actually start to return to some sense of a new normal. Um, and the only way that we can, you know, really prevent ourselves from really being limited and um, ha having another pandemic really change our lives forever is to have the science and the medicine right there and then to combat, you know, a new virus or whatever pathogen comes our way. So research has been really important. The money that's been poured into research has been really important. 
and the collaboration across different countries and different companies and different research institutions is also important. Um, the second lesson is public health messaging. Um, we've seen that the CDC and other agencies have had um, their fair share of challenges trying to convince the people, the population, to adopt public health practices and then to change public health practices when new information comes to light. And so it's really important to have messaging that is streamlined, that is simple and direct, and that also is very actionable for people to follow and to understand. Um, so that's uh, lesson number two. And then the third lesson that I myself have learned is how much politics can actually influence public health messaging and how much we've seen politicians and uh, different people in the political uh, arena change public health messaging, influence public health measures, even disregard or ignore public health um, uh, you know, uh, suggestions because it does not fit with their own political agenda. And you would think that a deadly virus being spread easily would unite everyone in terms of uh, figuring out, you know, solutions that work for for folks. But um, in fact, it turns out politics is an even stronger force. And so it's been really interesting, I think, for people in the medical and scientific professions to see how much it doesn't matter how much good work you do or how great your messaging is. If it's going to go against people's political beliefs or people's political ambitions or what have you, then you're going to have a problem. And, I think a lot of what we're seeing now in the United States is we've reached the ceiling in terms of um, who is getting vaccinated and who is going to adopt public health strategies because we're fighting against that political ideology. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Chetty. And we'll now open the, the discussion to our audience with any Q&A questions. If you have questions for Dr. Chetty, please submit them or your comments in the Q&A box. Thank you. So Sharon, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not seeing that we have any questions coming in on social media or from participants on the call now, but maybe what might be helpful is for you two to talk to Chidi about common questions that you hear when you're doing outreach in Harlem and the other um, boroughs of the city. What types of questions are you hearing from the community, communities that you're engaging and maybe how can Chidi help to answer those? Okay, absolutely. Um, Chineri has a question, so she'll go ahead and give that as well. Hi, Dr. Chidi. Um, I wanted to ask this question, right? What is the difference between the vaccines given in third world countries and versus the USA? Like seeing that people are required to take another vaccine as soon as they get into the country. What's the difference between these two? What's the difference between vaccines uh, given vaccine, here? Given in third world countries, like say, for example, in Nigeria, and then when you were required to come into the country, into the US, um, um, people actually met us at the outreach events and said, we are required to take another vaccine once we get into the country. So what's the difference between these vaccines back home and what we find here that makes people to get it again? Yeah, so I would say I'm not familiar with like the United States immigration and custom law. Like, I don't know why, I don't know the exact um, vaccines that they're requiring for people to take here, but I will talk generally to say that there's lots of different vaccines that exist around the world that are being given. So the United States primarily uses Pfizer and Moderna. and Those are the mRNA vaccines. They are the ones that I was describing earlier that uses that uh, mRNA instruction molecule to generate um, spike proteins against that our body recognizes as different um, and creates antibodies against. So, so that's the United States primary vaccine. Um, around the world, people are using, you know, the Oxford UK vaccine, and that one works a little differently, but they all are um, end up with having our bodies recognize the spike protein as foreign. Um, and so there's that vaccine that is used in certain sub sub-Saharan African countries, countries, as are Pfizer and Moderna. Um, there is also the vaccine from uh, China called the Sinopharm vaccine, and that one is also used in certain places around the world, and that just takes the COVID-19 virus and 
deactivates it, so it kills it, and then our and then um, our body recognizes the virus particles, but the virus itself can't do anything because he's dead, effectively. Um, and so those are vaccines that are also used around the world. But my suspicion, if people are being required to um, get vaccinated newly when they come to the United States, it's because they're uh, it's most likely because the United States wants them to use the vaccines that are primarily used here because we have more data and because they were based on research that was funded from, you know, research in America, um, Pfizer and Moderna. Um, but that said, you know, lots of vaccines are being used around the world with varying levels of efficacy, with Pfizer and Moderna being one of some of the best ones. Thank you. And one of the, Dr. Chetty, one of the things that we hear when we're out and about doing our community um, health work is about the vaccine and around the, the nature of the COVID-19 is the speed of the, 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 the vaccine creation. We've gotten a lot of questions about how fast this turnaround was and, and the whole thing about science being on one page and the politicians on the other page. That was one of one of our big pushbacks, you know, on the street talking about COVID nineteen getting vaccinated. Yeah, so that you know, people are have every right to ask that question because, like I mentioned earlier, it does seem like the, the vaccines came out pretty quickly from when COVID nineteen was first announced to when the shot was going into the first patient's arm. You know, that was about a year. Um, the my answer to this is that the technology that we that is the basis of the mRNA vaccines, so for Pfizer and Moderna, has been researched since the mid-19s, since 1995 and ongoing. And so the vaccines actually didn't come out of anywhere. They're actually based off 20 plus years of research that has been done to take this technology into what it is now, which is like viable, effective, highly safe vaccines with over 20 years of research. Now, what ended up happening is that uh, the Pfizer and Moderna technologies were actually being tested for uh, common cold and for mm -hmm. other types of viruses. And when this pandemic uh, you know, emerged, the companies rapidly changed their research program to see if they can develop vaccines against COVID-19. But the actual vaccine technology itself had been developed and the actual work that has been done to show that they're efficacious has been done too. Um, what made this so quick is that the, the, the need for vaccines was really, really high because we were experiencing our first pandemic in the 21st century, which meant that um, billions of dollars was poured into the research and that there was a lot of collaboration between clinical trial sites, a lot of collaboration between countries and with companies. And so you can imagine that all of the world's scientific enterprise, and all of the world's research capital and money was poured into solving this problem. And so what typically takes a couple of years to do clinical trials was being done at a breakneck speed. So it was fast, but it was based off research that has been done for decades and off uh, research precedent that we've known for other diseases as well. And so, um, you know, when there's a great need, you know, people come together and try to solve a problem, but mm -hmm. we didn't, we weren't starting from zero. We we're sort of starting from that, like a little bit past the halfway point, And then you sort of are given a push of money and a push mm -hmm. of, you know, some like, we need to get this done because people are dying. And then the work um, was expedited in that way. But it's, it was based off research that has been in existence for a long time. And so that should at least give people some, um, some solace. Great, thank you. One, another question that we, we tend to hear while we're out and about is about fertility issues, either with the gentleman not wanting to take the vaccine because, you know, they feel like it might affect their sexual um, uh, uh, problems, or the female might feel like her eggs or her um, ability to produce will be reduced if she takes the vaccine. How would you um, give an answer to the people in our community that are listening to this um, session of our COVID-19 Empower Hour? Yeah, I would say there's no evidence whatsoever that vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines affect fertility. This has been studied um, in multiple countries, multiple studies, and there's been no evidence shown that COVID-19 uh, vaccines affect uh, people's ability to conceive. And in fact, not getting vaccinated and being pregnant and getting COVID is actually quite 
um, it's a precondition for getting severe COVID effectively. Um, and there's been lots of really sad stories of people, um, pregnant women uh, who were not vaccinated getting COVID and having really ad adverse outcomes. Not only that, getting vaccinated against COVID and being pregnant, you're actually giving your baby antibodies against the virus and you're giving them actually some passive, what we call passive immunity, which means protection from the, from the maternal antibodies that are passed on to, um, to, the, to the child. And there's been studies showing that that is actually been quite protective against preventing infants from um, getting COVID. And so, you know, the the um, feeling is definitely like worth. It's scary. I can understand again why people would feel like, oh, I don't know. I heard on the internet that you know the vaccines do this, but I can tell you anecdotally, I have many many friends, and I've seen in the hospital many many women who have uh, been vaccinated and are pregnant or have given birth. Um, and uh, and same for men as too is that not having affected you know their ability to um, uh, basically conceive and so uh, again there's lots of research online the American College of Obstetrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology or ACOG it's a great website to check out they have all the studies because um, you can imagine people are quite worried about that um, and the CDC as well is another place people can go to read up on the actual statistics but. Um, no evidence. It's a conspiracy theory out there that is meant to uh, be one of the many reasons why folks are trying to convince people not to get vaccinated. Absolutely. 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 And my final question, Dr. Chetty, will be around mask wearing. We know the information has been changing. We've been um, going from wearing N95s to where we're just, um, we're now being able to go out in public <laughs> and I'll say see our full faces again. Um, is there, I suppose my question is, did we do this too fast or are we on the right track? Are we, obviously Chetty and I are, uh, Chinari and I are sitting together here, but and we're wearing our masks because we're, you know, in close con confinement. Should we still continue to wear our mask in public or, or are we on the right track in terms of us um, reducing the mask wearing where we go out? Hard question. My <laughs> <laughs> here, okay, so here, here's the framework. Here's the framework how I think about it. Um, people want a simple yes, no, should I do this, should I not do this sort of solution to a pandemic. This is the first time most of us are living through you know, a pandemic where we are constantly having to assess our risk. And so this is an awesome question and a hard question because it's mm -hmm. asking us, you know, how are we supposed to assess our level of risk? And there's a personal risk that we all have that's going to differ between each other. And then there's the population-wide risk that's also going to differ. And so to answer your question concre concretely, I will say, if now that we have vaccines and now that we have treatments and now that we have places where most people are, you know, sort of mandated to show some proof of vaccination. You can imagine being in a place that has a really high degree of vaccinated individuals and a really low degree of COVID transmission. We're sort of in that place now in a lot of places in, a, in the country where highly vaccinated population with not a lot of COVID around. In situations like that, you can imagine dialing down some of the mitigation strategies that you would ordinarily use, like wearing masks, because you feel a little bit more comfortable. Right. Um, and so, in situations like yours, for instance, if you know that you are, you guys are vaccinated and you know that, you know, COVID is not really surging like it was in New York City in December, then you can relax, you know, the mask. But that doesn't mean that it's going to stay that way. Right. Because in two, there's a new, you know, sub-variant out, BA2, that people believe may start rising, like start causing COVID to rise again. And in that situation, then you would say, huh. I'm feeling a little bit more uncomfortable now that COVID is rising in New York City. Let me start wearing masks again to, pr to protect myself. So I think what we need to actually end up doing and learning is to dial up and down our level of managing risk. I wear masks in subways because in subways you are filled with people who you don't know what their vaccination status is. And it's also just a pact. Um, and so in subways, I will be wearing a mask, but in my workstation with three other people, they're doctors, they're vaccinated, you know, that's a situation where I feel more comfortable taking off my mask to eat, for instance. And so we have to kind of pick up that skill as the months and years go by, um, because the situation will change, a new variant will come out, um, and there's that. 
the flip side is that we all have our own individual risk. And so some people are immunocompromised. Some people live with people who are immunocompromised. Some people are older or have diabetes or hypertension. We all are different when it comes to our baseline level of health. And so it's going to be hard for us moving forward to say, you need to do this like everyone else. when in fact, everyone's risk is just individually different. Um, and so that's why it's a hard question because there's no simple answer, but I, I, my answer is to say, let's adopt a framework that allows us to be smarter and more diligent with when, how we're assessing risk. Um, and by doing that, you at least can apply similar standards to different situations and um, hope for the best. I don't know. I think, I think we just have to get better at uh, thinking about our risk and, and uh, the CDC's job and health institutions job is to help people think about that as well we we have to turn to some of the experts to say hey okay what do you think about now that the situation has changed and that also requires us to also be continually learning and absorbing information too absolutely thank you and thank you that's um dr chetty it was a pleasure having you here today thanks for sharing your expertise on covid 19. Thank you for having me. This was fun. You're welcome. You're welcome. And everyone else, this has been our second COVID-19 Empower Hour, Learn How to Stop the Spread. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and you'll also find our podcast at African Services. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a safe and wonderful day. Bye.